Hi, my name's Mike. You may be wondering why my name isn't more flashy like Axe or Bull. Well, that's because this is the real world, not the movies. I work for Guardian, and you're about to see a video on kiss training. Now I know this is going to disappoint some of you, but I'm not going to be showing you how to tongue your lover. KISS stands for keep it simple, stupid. And it represents getting back to the basics of firefighting. This is the mission of Guardian. A return to perfecting many of the techniques that have been proven to work throughout the generations. Safeguarding them for future firefighters. Some of the things that you're going to see in our videos are probably not what you were taught in the academy or read in a textbook. And now you're probably saying to yourself, why should I try these techniques then? Well, the answer to that is simple. Because they're effing awesome. Besides, how could our salty old-timers be wrong? Listen, our academies and textbooks teach us many general practices, but common sense isn't one of them. Now, if you're the type of firefighter that needs a safe space or thinks that we should have layers of bubble wrap around us before doing our jobs, then these videos probably aren't for you. So do us all a favor and click that little X in the upper right-hand corner of your screen now. For those of you who still possess some mental toughness and grit, stay with us. We know that firefighting is an environmental emergency. Yes, fire hurts the environment, but that's not what I'm referring to. I'm talking about specific jurisdictional demands. For example, firefighting in a small town rural Montana isn't the same as a big city like Boston. They are completely different environments and have different methods and techniques of doing their jobs. The point being, you can never learn enough or train enough in our profession. If the day ever comes when you think that you've learned it all, that's the day you should retire. Or hey, become a chief. I'm obviously joking. Many of us would love to wear that white helmet one day. Regardless, I hope you stay with us for our videos. But for now, let's stop in to Station Hero and see what's going on around the firehouse today. All right, guys, for tonight's training, we're going to practice air conservation while learning real fire tactics from Axe, Bull, and watching them take their rookie under their wing, Stephen McCafferty, and the real life story of Backdraft. Hey, man. What are you idiots doing? We're watching Backdraft, learning tactics, and practicing air conservation. Oh, how's that for a Backdraft? Now, you guys can also practice your horizontal ventilation as well. Hey, who is that? It's Craig, man. Hey, man, what's going on? I heard you guys just got a job. Yeah, man, it was awesome. Fire everywhere. Wicked blaze. What are you doing, man? You getting cleaned up? No, nah, bro, I just taking care of the stash. If that's the only horizontal ventilation training that you're doing in your company, then you need to come with us to the training ground. Horizontal ventilation is the tactic performed during the initial fire attack. It is done to release trapped smoke and heat from inside of the structure. It also reduces the chances of a backdraft or a flashover. Inadvertently, this will assist any of the crews that are working on the interior. Ventilation is the thinking man's game, and it is typically done by the truck crews. Thank God it's not the engine guys. However, it is very much a team-oriented concept. So the main question is, when do we ventilate? And the answer to that is, never, unless you understand how flow paths work. Smoke and heat travel throughout the structure, and those variables change depending on whether we're opening doors or breaking windows. This is why your first arriving truck crews need to use thought and precision before they show up and start haphazardly opening doors, breaking windows, or making entryways where there weren't one to begin with. So we're gonna talk a little bit about a horizontal ventilation. Horizontal ventilation is understanding the flow paths and the direction that we're gonna be pushing the fire once we start opening doors and breaking windows. <sighs> horizontal, obviously it means horizon line. So it's very easy for some people to get this mixed up with vertical ventilation. Always think horizontal horizon. We know that the horizon is a straight lateral line with the sun coming up. So when you think about horizontal, 
Take a look at your dwellings that you're in front of. Horizontal is going to be across. So anything across, whether it's on the first floor or whether it's on the second floor, that is your horizon lines. Horizontal venting begins simply with the size up. And we're going to talk about that now. So what we have here is a two-story single frame dwelling. Obviously, this is side A, side B, side Charlie, side Delta. That's a tree. So as we arrive and start our size up, we're going to discuss what we actually see here. And this is your initial size up from your companies, whether it's an engine or a truck, is going to be, I have a two-story single frame dwelling, and I have nothing showing side alpha, side delta. Okay, so after we've committed ourselves and began, our, and began approaching the building, <clears throat> you might not have time to do an entire 360 of the home, in which most cases companies do not do that. We wait for our companies to show up in the rear and give us some feedback on what they see. We, we wait for our additional chiefs to show up, or our safety officers, and they let us know what's going on inside Charlie. However, your initial arriving engine and truck crews are going to see what they see in the front of the building and if they can see any of the sides. So as we approach, you notice that on the first floor, there seems to be some haze inside the windows. It's not directly venting outside, but you can see it in the windows. Now, it is important to take note of this because horizontal ventilation begins the second that you open this front door. Okay, I just mentioned that we don't always do a 360. Your SOGs or MRPs probably state that a 360 is always necessary. Of course, this is dependent upon the structure that you're getting ready to fight in. If the structure is large, if it's a row home, or if it's a large warehouse, you might not have the ability to do a complete walk around before beginning your initial fire attack. So as I stated on your size up and approach, you notice when you come to the front door that you see a light haze inside A and side Delta in the windows. Obviously with a light haze, you're not gonna start busting people's windows out. We're not gonna do more damage than necessary to someone's property. Because of this, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna enter through the front door. Right when we do that, our horizontal ventilation begins. So as you walk in, you'll notice that in the first floor, this is your front door, and we have a light haze throughout. This haze is obviously going to travel the path of least resistance, which means it's going to be going up the staircases. This will allow the second floor to also have a light haze if, in fact, all the bedroom doors or bathroom doors are open. Okay, so for the sake of this scenario, we're going to say that in the second floor, all these bedroom doors have been closed. However, the bathroom door was left open. This means that that smoke that was all on the first floor, that light haze, is going to travel that staircase and fill the hallways and into the bathroom. However, it's not going to be able to enter too much into these bedrooms because my blue lines represent a closed doorway. So just to help us keep our uh, waypoints here, I'm going to go back through and show you that this is side A, B, C, and delta D. Okay, I'm going to get rid of my tree because I have allergies and I don't like the pollen. Now. When we come in here and we notice that this smoke was basically banked down and sticking around in the first floor and didn't really travel too far into the second floor because our doors were closed, it is safe to assume that the fire is located either somewhere on the first floor or below us in the basement. So the reason I say that it's safe to assume that this fire is either on the first floor or in the basement it's just because of the smoke conditions. And remember that we said it was a light haze. All right. So it's not banking down. We can see as we're walking. We don't need to get down and crawl. Now, we're not going to go into what causes fires because that's not what this is about. We're talking about horizontal ventilation here. 
although we know from light hazes that it must be something of a small size in order to just produce a light haze. Now, once we have located the seat of the fire in this situation, we can extinguish it. However, because it is a light haze, we also want to go ahead and start ventilating this to clear out that haze. It helps us with visibility. Okay, so to begin our horizontal ventilation here, we're going to go down and search the basement, which I do not have a diagram of the basement on here. Um, however, we're going to assume, because there is no basement diagram, that the basement has no windows. That means the ventilation is going to occur mainly on the second and the first floors. Considering that the large amount of uh, visible smoke is on our first floor here, and it hasn't crept into our bedrooms, we're going to start going ahead and opening windows. We're going to open the windows down on the first floor first. All right. This means that your windows on side Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie and Delta can all get opened up. Because it's a light haze, we're not going to go around smashing out windows like a bunch of apes. We're going to make sure that we go in. If the window allows us, we lower the, the top portion and then crack the bottom portion. This will create a nice vacuum and allow the smoke to clearly leave the structure and clear out our first floor. And remember, we've already started this process from opening that front door. Okay, so because we have a relatively small fire and just a light haze, and you've already started the process of horizontal ventilation by opening the front door, for this specific scenario, it's not necessary to start ventilating from the top right away. As your companies walk in and realize that it is a small fire, their initial reaction is going to be to start opening up these windows. Simultaneously, your crews upstairs can probably be doing the same thing. However, it doesn't, not to need, it doesn't need to be in any specific order for this specific fire. So the scenario we just looked at is representative of a small fire. Usually, for larger fires, we start our horizontal ventilation from top to bottom. But in reality, when we walk into a building knowing that it is a pot of food or a small fire somewhere located in the basement of the first floor, we're going to begin our horizontal ventilation as we enter through the front door and as our companies start to clear those first floor rooms. Okay, so for our next scenario, we're going to up the stakes a little bit. <clears throat> we're going to increase our fire load. It obviously begins with the size up. So as our companies arrive, our truck and our engines, what we see is side alpha, side delta, and we notice that we have smoke coming out of the bay window inside Alpha. I'm not much of an artist, but I will cut my ear off after this session and mail it to my girlfriend. That's a Van, Van Gogh reference if anyone doesn't know. We also show smoke showing from side Delta. Now, in this window on the, dark, on the uh, Delta Charlie corner, we have turbulent smoke. Now this isn't a class on reading smoke. It's a class on horizontal ventilation. However, you need to know that if you see turbulent smoke coming out of one window versus the other ones, then that is going to be more than likely closest to the seat of the fire. All right, so we're going to fill out our interior on the first floor too to make sure that uh, everything is lining up accurate. So we have our front door, and this is all full of smoke. And it's heavy smoke. It's thick. We have to get down and get low. Here's our Charlie Delta corner. And this is where our extremely turbulent smoke is. And as I said, this is probably closer to where the seat of the fire is going to be. So we have smoke coming out of all of our windows on all sides. Okay, so this is where our teamwork begins, as we talked about earlier. It is a perfect dance between truck crews and engine companies once we start our approach to this building. So inevitably, with a major fire that could be occurring in the kitchen or directly below the kitchen, more than likely we're going to see at least a light haze of sorts 
emanating from our upper floor windows. It might be very light, and if it is, it can be assumed, but not factual, that our bedroom doors were more than likely left closed. As you can see on our interior diagram, our blue lines represent closed bedroom doors. So that will limit the amount of smoke travel and of course heat and fire that is able to get up into the second floor. Now we all know one thing is for sure. Smoke is like water. It follows the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance is always going to be going up. So wherever there's a staircase, we get what we call the chimney effect, which means that our smoke is going to rise and our heat is going to rise from the first floor staircase up into the second floor. So if you pull up and you see this, and there's only light smoke coming out of that second floor, it's very safe to assume that whoever lived in this home left these bedroom doors closed and the wind is tight. Okay, so here's where the dance occurs between our truck crews and our engine company. As we approach, E is gonna represent our engine crew. Okay, and our truck crew obviously is gonna start ladder deployment. Ladder deployment is going to occur, at least in our current MOPs with the jurisdiction I work for, on side A and side B, your initial arriving truck. So with a two-story dwelling, we're gonna be bringing a 24-foot ladder, two 24s or a 24 and a 16 extension. Once our ladders are in place, and for the sake of our diagram, I'm gonna use one ladder, and that ladder is gonna be thrown to this window. Forgive my artwork. This represents our truck crew, the ladder. Now we threw the ladder over top of the first floor window and not the front door because we don't want to jam up our engine crews while they're getting ready. Not all jurisdictions work the same. And with limited manpower, some of us need to perform tasks that we wouldn't normally do. This means that on, in some companies, only one truck company or one truck crew will arrive. That leads to the fact that they need to do the laddering of the entire building. Okay, once our engine crews are in place and they have their charge line, they're waiting at the front door to enter, our truck guys are gonna start horizontal ventilation. That's gonna begin from top to bottom, okay? So our truck guys are taking windows out. If we can reach, then we can use our ceiling hook to reach over and at least get a small bit of this cleared. If not, we're climbing down and then we'll clear that window a little bit later. Horizontal ventilation occurs from top to bottom with these major fires because we are going to release that heated smoke and that superheated gas that is collecting on those upper floors. This is gonna allow our engine company to enter through the front door. It's gonna reduce the beating that they're about to take on the inside. Okay, so while our engine company is proceeding through to try to find the seat of the fire, our truck guys who have entered through the second floor are, com are committing to their searches, but at the same time, they're ventilating along the way. So they're busting out these windows, okay? As they work their way through, they're taking windows out. That's releasing all that superheated gas. Our engine company and whatever truck guys we have on the first floor doing searches are also coming through and they're breaking out windows as well. Remember that the front door has been opened by this engine company so that horizontal ventilation has begun. That front door has remained open so you got a lot of smoke exiting that as well. Now by doing this, we have simultaneously created a vacuum in the house. And what I mean by that is that the minute our truck company start taking out this second floor and our engine goes through and opens the door, the fire is going to be drawn along with all those superheated gases throughout the home if it hasn't already, okay? So even though these doors might be closed, that fire is itching now to come up this staircase and try to get into these rooms. That's where it wants to go. 
because we have introduced oxygen to it. And by opening the front door and breaking that second floor window, she wants to come in there very bad. But that door will still help prevent it from coming through. Okay, so just as a quick side note to our truck crews, when you're doing these searches and you've entered through the second floor windows, this is exactly why you keep these doors closed. So after you commit to your search and you exit that room to go to another one, have the mindset and try to remember to close the door behind you again. That way that fire doesn't creep behind you into that room. Okay, so let's get back over here and talk a little bit more about this dance between the truck and engine. So as I said, our truck crews are going to ventilate top to bottom. Now, if you're on a truck company and you're climbing this ladder to ventilate the second floor window, the engine guys, you don't want to come in and bust this window out while your truck guy is on that ladder. Okay, That's going to allow for superheated gas to come out of this window and roast him while he's trying to enter the second floor. Likewise, if you're on the truck, you want to get up this ladder and into that second floor window, get it open as fast as possible so that you allow your buddies on the engine company to not take too much of a beating. Okay, our tactics and techniques behind horizontal ventilation isn't going to change a whole lot, even if we have fire showing. So when we're looking at our initial diagram here, we assume that the seat of our fire was back here in the Charlie Delta corner of the first floor. However, even if we could verify that the fire was here, and if the fire was on the second floor, showing, that's not going to change the fact that we are still going to use horizontal ventilation from top to bottom. Okay, so we all know in modern times we have serious manpower issues. We're doing more with less. And we know that we can't always put enough personnel on the ground to have one large coordinated attack. With adequate personnel, we know that we can perform the jobs of horizontal ventilation simultaneously. Your truck crews can take windows out on the second floor while your engine company advances into the first floor and front door. Along with them, any truck members you have will also be taking out windows on the first floor after the second floor is complete. With your limited manpower, we have to be more methodical which means your crews are going to have to go in and make sure that they achieve that second floor and removal of windows before the first floor windows all get removed. Okay, we just saw on the whiteboard how horizontal ventilation affects the flow path of heat and fire. Now we're going to show you with our burn building so that you can see in actual size what will happen when you open different windows and doors and you can also see some of the different techniques that we use for actual horizontal ventilation. All right, take your mind back to the whiteboard that we just looked at. What we have behind us now is a burn building. It's two stories, okay, and I'm standing in front of the front door, just like the drawing that we used on the whiteboard. Now we're going to go scenario by scenario. So the very first thing that we discussed was showing up and our size up showed a very light haze of smoke behind window number one here on the first floor, okay? I'm standing in front of Alpha side, obviously, and Bravo is gonna be to my immediate right, your left, the way that you're watching. Let's use common sense here, and not the idea that we must go and break the windows on the second floor right away. As we said, with our size up, as you come to the front, you realize and see behind the window that there is a light haze. So, we're gonna proceed in, and as I open the front door, whether I'm a truck guy or part of the engine crew, by me beginning to go in and see what the cause of the fire may be, or the cause of the smoke, rather, I have just begun horizontal ventilation. Okay, again, to reiterate, as you approach and you're doing your size up, you realize that there's just a light haze behind the window. With that said, more than likely, your truck crews are not going to go throwing their ladders, at least let's hope not, throwing their ladders and busting out windows or walking by and popping the windows on the first floor. We're going to use common sense. We're going to open the front door, and we're going to see what we have. 
Okay, as I open the front door, <coughs> we see what we are expecting, a light haze behind the front door. Common sense tells us that this is probably a very small fire or just something burning. Might even be a pot of food. The first things we're going to do when we enter is more than likely start to open our windows. If it is just a light haze, we don't need to go through and bust them out. Let's go in and open them up. By doing so, we are creating a flow path and continuing our horizontal ventilation. Okay, we have just created a different flow path for our smoke to, to travel. <clears throat> we are letting it exit the building. It's clearing it out. It's allowing us to have more visibility inside. Obviously, once you start opening these windows, as I said before, for just a light haze, we're not going to break people's windows. We're going to open them up, hopefully top to bottom if those windows allow, and then we're going to proceed upstairs and open those as well. Take your mind back to scenario two when we were looking at the whiteboard. Your size up initially showed smoke showing from division one, which is the first floor, and division two, which is the second floor of side alpha. You also saw heavy smoke showing on side delta. What we're going to show you now is what the dance looks like between the engine crews and the truck companies when we start our ventilation process in order to go in and extinguish a fire. Okay, so let's take a look at how this teamwork should appear. Your truck companies are approaching. They threw their ladders to the second floor. Your engine company is getting off. They're stretching their line. They're masking up. Okay, these things are taking place at the same time. Let's watch our truck man as he approaches the window that he's going to start horizontal ventilation on. Remember, we are starting from top to bottom. This is a significant fire. Okay, our truck guy's climbing the ladder. He gets within reach, but not with his head in the window, and he's going to use his hook and open up. Horizontal ventilation has now begun. Your engine company has opened up the front door. Our engine company is going in to try to locate the seat of the fire. We have now changed the flow path of all of our fire and smoke. Okay? By opening up that second window, Greg is now sucking this heat and smoke up the staircase and out the windows or collecting it up in the second floor. We don't know if that door is closed inside that bedroom. <laughs> However, if it is, then it's going to save Greg some time because that fire is not going to be able to get to him while he's doing his search. Our engine company is proceeding through, and while they're doing so, they're also taking out windows, along with other truck guys on the first floor. This is simulating horizontal ventilation in the order it's meant to be. We're going from the second floor to the first floor. Notice that I didn't pop this window open until my truck guy was through the window. If there was a fire down here, and I did, I'm going to fry him while he's on that ladder trying to gain entry. Horizontal ventilation is complete once you have your entire second floor open and once you have your entire first floor open. You just got to see how the flow path of the smoke changes using horizontal ventilation. We also touched on the objects that get used in horizontal ventilation. That is front doors, windows, even cellar doors, which we don't have here, and any openings that is created by the firefighter itself. One thing that we want to keep in mind anytime we're removing windows for horizontal ventilation and even removing front doors is that we need to remove the entire window, all the glass and all the hardware in the window. We don't want to leave bits and pieces of windows left behind. That can prove to be detrimental later in the event of needing to enter or exit through that window. Again, we want to stress using common sense here. If it is just a light haze inside of a building, we're not going to go through out breaking windows. We're going to find whatever it is that's burning and extinguish it. And more than likely, you're going to be entering, walking through, and opening windows as you go. So the process of having to run upstairs and open all those windows up first usually can be negated. However, on a significant fire where we have to charge our hose lines, it's important that you always start your ventilation from top to bottom. Okay, so now we're going to take a look at the actual techniques 
involved with horizontal ventilation. We're going to look at the techniques behind ventilating from a ladder, ventilating from the ground, and ventilating in the front door, and also cellar doors. Remember that we're ventilating high to low, and that is because of the mushrooming effect. The term mushrooming effect refers to the heat and smoke as it rises up the staircases onto the highest point, whether it's the second floor or whether it's the attic. We have to remember that heat and smoke are going to take the path of least resistance. That's always going to be up and out. Okay, so with that said, let's take a peek at how horizontal ventilation should look from a ladder. Okay, Greg's going to get to his desired height. His desired height is going to be below the window. He does not want his upper torso right in front of the window when he goes to break it. We're going to use the six-foot hook for what it was intended. It's six foot for a reason. So Greg's going to reach up with his hook using the extension of his hook. He's going to pop that window. Now, obviously, these are steel windows, but in real life, you're going to have glass. So Greg's going to reach in, come down as hard as he can on that window sash in order to take out the entire window. This is going to rele release all that superheated gas and smoke. So as Greg prepares to enter, he's going to make sure that all that extra glass is cleared out before he starts. Okay, so as he ascends, he's going to lightly sound the floor. And he's going to make sure that he has one hand on the outside and one hand on the inside, not grabbing the window frame itself. Okay, after Greg enters, he begins his search, attempting to make sure that that bedroom door is closed while he's performing it. And as he's progressing through his shirts, if he comes to another window, he's going to make sure that he opens that window up. This is going to complete his horizontal ventilation of that area. Okay, so we're going to talk about the front door a little bit. <clears throat> Horizontal ventilation begins, as we said before, when you open the front door. So your engine crews or your truck guy, whoever goes in first, whether he's committing to a search on the first floor or whether it's the engine guys getting ready to stretch their line, the minute they pop this door, horizontal ventilation has begun. Let's remember we're talking about common sense. This isn't a common practice in every fire department, but it could prove to be important. Once we begin our horizontal ventilation by opening the front door, our engine crews are going to start advancing their line. If something goes wrong and this front door closes behind them, it can easily pinch their line. That will cut off their water supply. For this reason, in certain times, it might be imperative for a truck guy to come and remove this front door, whether he takes it off with a saw or whether he just pries it off at the hinges with a set of irons. The benefit to this, of course, is going to allow for the free flow of crews to go inside, but it will also allow for an expedient egress in case someone gets hurt or they find a trapped victim. This is a technique that is not often performed, although it needs to be considered. This is because it has resulted in the loss of firefighters' lives. When a firefighter advances his hose line through this door, if the door does swing shut, especially if the door is a heavy door, it can pinch that hose line. Inadvertently, that's almost going to act like a door chalk. It's going to pinch that door shut, and the firefighter is now inside and unable to kick the door open. When that door slams shut on that hose line, the reason it acts as a door chalk is because of the pressure coming through the line. That water pressure, not only is it going to bubble on the inside, but it's also going to do it on the outside. That's going to prevent that door from opening up nice and easily. So when that firefighter is in there taking a beating and it's getting hot, he's unable to get out. To prevent this situation from occurring, we want to make sure that when we do take the front door off, we start from the lowest hinge. That's because if you start from the top and work your way down, naturally what you're going to see is as you remove these hinges, this door is going to fall. And as it falls, it's going to immediately pinch that hose. And it's going to be very difficult again to get it off. So we want to start cutting down here and work our way up for easy door removal. 
especially if there was already a line in place going into the building. Okay, let's talk a little bit about ground floor windows. We've already done our top floors, so we're working from top to bottom. We already talked about our front door. Let's take a look at how we vent from outside on the ground floor. <clears throat> Common mistakes that are made with ground floor windows. Guys will come up and immediately try to punch them out, just like this. The problem with this technique is that I'm standing directly in front of this window. That means what's ever behind it is going to hit me in the face, okay? Whether it's superheated gas or whether it's fire, it's coming right at me. If you don't have your SCBA on, you're going to look like Freddy Krueger. There's a reason why we choose the six-foot ceiling hook for ventilation purposes. That's because it gives us a nice extension. It keeps us safe, but still acts like an arm for everything that we're doing. When we approach our ground floor windows, we want to approach them from the side, and we want to be upwind. So what do I mean by upwind? That means that whatever direction that smoke is coming out of that window, you want to be opposite of that. So let's just say for the sake of this scenario that our smoke is coming out of this window and going in the direction of this concrete pillar. My placement needs to be right here. I am upwind from that smoke. So the chances of me inhaling any smoke or getting hit by flames is minimized. I'm going to use my six foot hook and I'm going to use it to the best of its capability, which means I'm going to keep myself a safe distance from this window. When I come in to hit it, I'm aiming for that middle sash of the window, coming down on it as hard as I can in an attempt to bust out the entire window. While I'm doing so, just like our firefighters that are on the ladder, I'm going to turn my head away or put my head down because I don't know what's going to be coming out of that window. This is what it would look like. Pulling down and removing that sash. As I'm doing that on my initial hit, I'm going to keep my head low just in case there's a lot of heat and flames behind that window. Okay, so we talked about first floor windows. Last but not least is the basement windows. If the house has basement windows, that's going to be the very last thing we take out because we're moving in an order from high to low. The basement windows may prove to be crucial because it could be where the seat of the fire is. Most basement windows are going to look like these small casement windows. So as you come by, Again, stand to the side of it, make sure that you are upwind, and you're going to break it out with any cross member that may be there in an attempt to pull the entire window out. One of the last things we need to make sure that we touch on are cellar doors or Bilco doors. These are usually found in the rear of a home or to the side, either side Bravo or side Delta. They need to be opened up. Not only do they provide adequate ventilation, but they also work perfectly in the means of an emergency egress. Cellar doors can prove to be a hassle, so you need to make sure that you're choosing the right tool for the job. You also need to find out what material the doors are made of, whether you have to choose a saw and cut the locks off, or whether you need to cut the hinges, or maybe you can go through the door with an ax or a maul, depending if it's wood or any type of lighter, other lighter material. One thing we want to discuss before we move on is a common practice that we see on the fire grounds, and that is throwing a ladder between the windows. The reason that this is done is to expedite the ventilation process. However, it has some serious drawbacks. As I said, the reason that this ladder is thrown between these two windows is in order to speed up the process of horizontal ventilation. It's done by first reaching over and busting out part of this window and then turning and hitting the window to your right. The concept is great. You get two windows with one ladder. However, it's not proven to actually be functional in all aspects. The reason that this isn't a great method is because you cannot completely remove both windows while the ladder is between them. Does this help release the trapped smoke and heat? Yes. Is it proper ventilation? No, it's not. The windows are still semi-intact. They're not completely removed. It works much better when your ladder is directly underneath the window so that you can take the window out in its totality. In addition, Working from a ladder and having to go back and forth between windows creates unnecessary risks, such as tripping or falling off of the ladder. Having the ladder between the windows isn't useful to a truck guy going in to do a search. You have to climb down, reposition the ladder, and then climb through a window. You're wasting valuable time, and if someone is inside, they're waiting for you to arrive.
We've talked pretty thoroughly about venting from the exterior. Now we're going to focus on horizontal ventilation from inside. I'm going to skip over opening the door because if you come to a doorway while you're inside that is unlocked, all you can do is need to simply open that door and now you have started horizontal ventilation. If you come across a locked door, find a way to open it. Either unlock it with your hand, use the proper tool to cut or pry and get that door open. Okay, so we're going to direct our attention to windows. <clears throat> the scenario would be that you've already entered the building either from the front door or from a ladder. So when you come across a window inside, you want to ventilate that window because you've already started horizontal ventilation elsewhere. If your scenario is that you've entered from a ladder and through a window, you're going to be committing yourself to a search of that room. As you come around the room and find an, another window, you're going to want to ventilate. Interior windows usually have other structures around them. For example, shades or blinds. Sometimes they may have an, even have an air conditioner in the lower portion of it. The very first thing you want to do when you come to a window that has some of these other structures is remove them completely. The easiest way to do that could be by hand, just forcefully removing them, or you could use your ceiling hook and pull and yank them down. After you remove the shades and the blinds from the window, make sure that there's not an air conditioning unit or a fan in the lower portion. If there is, we want to make sure that we pull that inside and not push it out. The reason that we're going to pull this air conditioning unit or fan in is that all over the country, many, many times a year, firefighters get injured by air conditioners or other window units falling out and it ends up hitting them while they're standing in the front yard. After you check to make sure that there's not an air conditioning unit or a fan in the window, you're going to need to remove all the glass from the window. What we have here is a casement window. But first, I want you to envision it being a regular window with a sash or a crossbar going right across it. This would separate your upper pane and your lower pane. That's what we normally see in structures. Remember that in the scenario we discussed that you came through the window using a ladder and you committed yourself to a search and now you come across another window and you're getting ready to clear it. In doing that, we're assuming that there's a significant fire inside this dwelling. Because of that, this room is probably full of smoke and the thermal layering has begun, which means when you're going to go and remove this window, you might not want to stand straight up because the heat up high is going to be increasingly more significant than the heat down low. So when you're removing this window, you can begin punching that glass out from a kneeling position. That's going to let some of that heat exhaust. Following that removal, it might make conditions better. And then you'd be able to come up to almost a crouching position. From this position, take your ceiling hook. And remember, we're assuming that there is a sash here. You would be able to come down with your hook directly on top of that sash. And if you come down forceful, you'll be able to put a slight bend in that sash from which you'll be able to take either your claw end, your claw end, or your Boston and yank that whole sash in, bringing the remnants of the window with it. If there's anything left behind in that window, such as glass or any remnants of the sash, we need to make sure that we clear that out immediately. This is done just in case we need to use that window as an emergency egress. Now let's take a look at this actual window, which is called a casement window. You can see that it's double paned, or maybe you can't. However, there's an inner and an exterior, which means you're going to be going through two panes of glass in order to ventilate. Glass is glass, and we break it the same. You'll take your hook, you'll punch it through, and you'll clear the entire window. You have to remember that we are assuming that this is a significant fire and you've already crawled in through a ladder. When removing a window from the interior during a significant fire, you have to remember that you want to be fast but thorough. We need to get this window open as quickly as possible and completely. You are releasing all that superheated gas and smoke that is hovering above and around you. This is going to let all that smoke and gas exhaust and create a better condition for you to visualize any trap victim that there may be in the room. We all know how to remove your typical interior window that would have a sash across it. It's pretty simple to be able to put that pane up and down or to unclip it and take it out completely. However, this is a casement window and they are becoming more and more common in structures, even in your typical private dwellings. 
In order to remove a casement window in the event of a very small fire or just a light haze and you need to ventilate, the first thing we're going to do is use our crank and open it up. If you're unable to crank that casement window open, double check to make sure that your latch has been completely unlocked. On large casement windows, especially in business or commercial buildings, you could have two or even three of these latches that you're going to need to unlock in order to crank this window open. Regardless of what type of window you're dealing with, whether it's a casement window or whether it's your regular window where it has an upper pane and a lower pane and a sash, when you're removing them from an interior, you're already inside of an IDLH environment, which means you've came through the front door or a window. This has started our horizontal ventilation process, so all you're, new, all you're doing now is continuing it. Remember when you're inside, you need to be staying low because of the thermal layering. As you approach the window, you want to make sure that you're removing the upper panels first, that way you're releasing all that superheated gas and smoke. And then continue to remove the remainder of the glass and any other structure inside. As that heat releases, and as that smoke releases, visibility is going to improve. That's going to allow you to maybe come off the floor from a crawling position and continue your search or continue to look for other windows to ventilate. Keep in mind that when you're performing window ventilation from the interior, a lot of times we can find our victims right below the windowsill. This is a place where they usually come and hide during a fire if they're unable to escape. So as you remove those windows from the interior, always double check below the window sill and feel around to make sure that there's nothing there. We're going to talk about a little bit of the problems that we might run into when trying to perform horizontal ventilation. First being windows. A lot of windows have security measures on them or are buttoned up tight with plywood. One thing to keep in mind when you're dealing with windows that have security measures such as bars is that there are a couple of different ways that you can open them. When attacking bars that are secured to exterior windows, one thing we need to do is locate where that bar is anchored into the window frame or the exterior wall. A common practice in removing bars from windows is to take our saw, metal cutting, and attack the hinges. You'll see in a lot of companies where they will come in with the saw and start to remove the hinges from top to bottom and they'll remove both sides and then remove the bars completely. A more efficient practice may be to attack only one side of where these, these bars are anchored or hinged. If you choose to do it this way, you take your saw and you would cut the interior side of these bars. And what I mean by interior is you want to cut the hinges or the anchor points that are closest to the front door. Okay. Reason being is that once you cut these two hinges or anchor points, you're then going to take the bars and open them as if you would open a cabinet or a doorway, creating a nice open space to gain access to that window. The reason that we're going to open in this direction is because if you were to do it opposite and open inward, you're creating a hazard for your companies that could be walking by going towards that front door. It'd be very easy, to, easy for them to hit their head or get entangled on these bars that you cut. Another troublesome area can be windows that have air conditioning units in them. If you have to enter through a window that has an air conditioning unit by the use of a ladder, you need to be extremely careful once you're climbing up it. If there is significant fire behind that window, then it can weaken the integrity and that air conditioning unit can begin to melt and could fall out on top of you. If your only means of getting to the second floor is through a window with an air conditioning unit in and off of a ladder, use extreme caution. Make sure that that air conditioning unit does not fall out on you and push it in as gently as possible, just in case there's a victim on the other side. If at all possible, air conditioning units are better removed from the interior versus pushing them in off of a ladder. Another common problem that you might run into, depending on your jurisdiction, is coming across plywooded windows or doors. The reason that these present an issue is twofold. One, the method of them being secured to the window frame, and two, there could be some object behind them using it as an anchor point. This can become extremely hazardous when you're trying to open plywood windows using a 35 or a 24 foot ladder. In order to make your job easier, stop and do a size up prior to climbing the ladder. 
This is going to tell you two things, what tool you're going to need and what you're getting ready to attack. What I mean by that simply is this. If there are plywooded windows on the first floor or on the front door, take a look at those before you start advancing up the ladder. You're looking for what is anchoring that plywood into the window frame. What I mean by that is, is it a nail or is it a deck screw? This may dictate exactly which tool you plan on taking with you up the ladder. <clears throat> Nails, a lot of times can be pulled down and apart using a ceiling hook or a pry tool such as a halligan. Deck screws are gonna create a serious hazard for anyone working off of a ladder. A better tool of choice for dealing with any plywood that's anchored with deck screws would be to take an entry saw with you up the ladder and make a cut. There are many methods to using an entry saw to cut through plywood. However, if you're on a ladder, you want to try to use the safest method possible. When working off a of ground ladders to remove plywood from upper floors, it's important that you take your time. It can be extremely cumbersome and exhausting. In order to make it safer, a good practice is to put your ladder to the side of the window and extend it close to the top. This can make it easier for you to take your saw or your ceiling hook or pry tool and attack one side of the plywood. By doing so, it's going to allow you to take that side that you attacked once you have it opened, cut, or pried off, and then simulate the hinge effect of being able to open it like a cabinet or a front door. If you're attempting to remove plywood for the speed of entry, a faster way would be to put your ladder directly under the window as if you normally would. Take your saw, start at the top, and cut one line straight down. This would then allow you to use a pry tool, a halligan, or even a ceiling hook and pull from the top of each panel and then open. There are other methods of removing plywood from doors and windows. We only showed you a couple. You need to find the one that works best for you and stick with it. When encountering plywood on front doors, we want to assess how it's anchored, whether it's nailed or with decking screws. If we have nails, of course we can try to pry. If we have deck screws, then let's go right to an entry saw in order to be more efficient. One of the most efficient cuts you can make using an entry saw would be to take your saw and take a nice cut right down the middle, starting at the top, bringing it all the way down to the base of the door. This cuts your surface area in half. In turn, it's gonna make it much easier to pry apart from here. Once you have your cut down the middle, you can then work on two small sections versus one large section of plywood. Many homes have screen doors or storm doors. They're made of various materials. Of course, if you approach one that just has glass in it, common sense is gonna tell you to break the glass, attempt to reach in and unlock the door, if the conditions are allowing. Other times, the material could be made out of bars running the entire length of the door. If this door is locked, then the best option here would be to go ahead and take your saw and start a cut. When using your metal saw on a storm door, some of your most obvious cuts would be first to attempt to take the lock mechanism out of the game, which means you'd bring your saw in and cut right away wherever that door handle is, hoping to cut through that locking mechanism. Another technique would be to cut the hinges, removing them one by one until you're able to remove the storm door completely. Regardless of the method you choose, a good practice would be to remove the storm door completely. That way there's no chance of it falling back in and pinching your line when you're trying to advance hose. There are a few ways that you can improve your skills when it comes to horizontal ventilation. One is getting comfortable with your equipment, knowing your tools, knowing how to use them. Also, being comfortable by working on a ladder. One of the most important things you can do is to know your area. Know the type of structures you're dealing with. Look at anything that might impede you from doing proper horizontal ventilation. And as always, when you train, train in full PPE. Make sure that you're wearing the exact gear that you would be wearing when you're doing it for real. Horizontal ventilation is one of the most important tactics done on the fire ground. Prior to it happening, we need to take extra precaution when we're doing our size ups. We need to make sure that the windows that we are getting ready to remove or the doors that we are preparing to open are not going to lead to fire spread. Thank you for joining us, and if you like what you saw, then check us out on the web. To all you Facebook firemen, let the trolling begin, and I want to say thank you for your service. 
But to all you real firemen, keep it simple. And we're going to be cliche and say, see you on the big one.